I um, also respect the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. And I think that that is particularly important when we're talking today about things like belonging and loneliness, because um, in all of my interactions with um, doing research and um, teaching with Aboriginal communities and people, I've never felt, um, I've been so humbled by the welcome that I have had. Um, and yet I know the loneliness that um, white Australia has imposed on um, through dispossession. So I think it is a, a really important to, um, to acknowledge this today in, in terms of the topics that we're talking about. Um, I've also got um, on, a, on a more uh, practical note, a, um, a list um, for contact lists so that we can pass that around just in case none, um, some of you aren't on the um, Disability Research Network contact list. We'd love to keep in touch. So I will be passing that around um, and that'll allow you also to make sure you have access to the live feed if you want to send it on to people who you think would be interested. Um, so we are starting today, we're we starting, sorry, go backwards. <laughs> um, we're starting today with um, Helen, yes. Um, my dear friend Helen, who has, um, it has an, is an associate professor from the University of New South Wales. Um, Helen um, and I met over 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> when Helen was the inaugural chair of the Critical Disability Studies Network um, as a part of the Sociological Association. Um, anyone who's done research in um, social work or disability will know of Helen. She has an incredible international reputation and as somebody who has led um, disability studies uh, and particularly at the intersections of um, disability and race, disability and gender, disability and colonisation. Um, so I am really excited that Helen has agreed to talk to us today. And um, I would just get you, Helen, to manoeuvre into this, this particular spot, which I'm sure Sean will be exacting about. <laughs> <laughs> right where I am, I think. Oh, okay, sure. Sean didn't tell me to do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, my name's uh, Dr. Louisa Smith. I am one of the co-conveners with Sean, Lynn and Shushi of the um, Disability Research Network of the University of Wollongong. Um, I do work particularly in um, the space of dementia and disability and how that intersects with social policy and social change. Um, the research network, I'll just keep talking for a second. The research network itself is aimed at not only forming a connection across people, um, across the whole university, but also bringing in um, service, disability service providers and other um, networks to come and share their knowledge and expertise um, and so that we can create productive dialogues. And I am going to, would you like me to touch that? Your yes, I don't want to break your dress. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, there we go. Okay, is it okay? Sound okay. I guess from that point of view, you also know someone who might be interested in being out of this and some of the other things that are going to be in the world. Okay, um, thanks to Sean and the network and Louisa for inviting me. In fact, I realised it was 40 years ago I worked at Wollongong Uni teaching the Diploma of Intercultural and Multicultural Education. God knows why I was qualified to do that. But <laughs> and there were two buildings, I do remember that. Mm -hmm. um, this is a sort of way out my area. I've never written in this area as I'm more of a social scientist than a, a, a trauma or a, um, a therapeutic person. So what I'm going to do today is really just um, introduce um, the relationship between loneliness, depression, anxiety, if you want to put that in there too, and the neoliberal state. And I've cheekily put in another title called, or The Great Australian Loneliness Revisited. Does that ring a bell for anybody, The Great Australian Loneliness? Ah, you're all too young. 1930, I found the book. 
I was riffing through the university's stacks and I found The Great Australian Loneliness, written by, and I wasn't sure it was a man or woman, but Ernestine Hill. And I started reading it, and it's quite incredible, because in 1930, Ernestine Hill decided, who was a journalist, media studies, Sean, um, decided to ride around the whole of Australia um, looking at how people had lived, in particularly in terms of their relationships and interrelationships and so on. I mean, I've dipped into it, haven't read it yet, but it's absolutely riveting. And um, in a sense, why I thought I should bring this book and introduce it is the great Australian loneliness in 1930 was actually living remote. And I think, I hope I'm not doing her a disservice because I've only dipped into it, it was both black and white loneliness, right? So there were dispossessed Aboriginal people, obviously, and there were an awful lot of white men scratching a living on, you know, a couple of acres or whatever. Not so many white women, of course. So, um, yeah, so now we, um, moving along. So, some of the key points, I've just mentioned Ernestine Hill. Um, and I guess why I decided to write a paper was because the media is absolutely full of loneliness issues. So from better homes and gardens, gardening today, new woman, Vogue, and on and on and on it goes. And the ABC, you know, everything on the ABC has done a program on loneliness. Um, you know, Sydney Morning Herald or the Good Weekend, whatever, those sorts of things, it's just everywhere. And so there's an epidemic. We don't actually know there's an epidemic because nobody has done actually the research in Australia. But the discourse of both loneliness, depression, suicidality, epidemic, just turn on the news and you hear that. So that's sort of quite frightening, I think, that we, we're being told that these epidemics, some of these are... Um, statements that really they're just to sort of cover the, you know, the, the area. Obviously, it crosses race, disability, gender, age, and geographical location. Being alone is not the same as loneliness. You can be lonely in a crowd, or you can be happy being alone. So clearly, you have to make those distinctions. Government initiatives, the major one being quoted is in the UK. There's a, a minister for loneliness and then there's discussions in the Australian media about whether we need one here too. There's very little being done in Australia by governments or researchers. There is one website and this is where I have a go at universities. And I think there's something like 20 universities have signed up to the website and they've stolen the label of the, uh, the campaign from England, Campaign to End Loneliness, and then you get this enormous list, including University of Wollongong, of universities who've signed up. And? <laughs> I was about to swear, but I'm being streamed. There's nothing else. There's not a contact name, or a number, or a person. <laughs> So, this is my concern about universities. I can say this because I'm sort of outside. So, um, but there is one survey done by Swinburne. Now, I think that survey really needs critiquing, which I'm about to do. And over lunch, I've launched a website, which I've never done in my life before, which is also called The Campaign to End Loneliness, um, with a bunch of people from the Hawkesbury. And one of the things we're first going to do is critique Swinburne because they've done, their research was basically online survey, people chose or not to fill it in, and then they made these major conclusions which were then replicated by the ABC, SBS, whatever, as the truth. So nobody has done, um, as far as I can tell, through looking through the literature in Australia, any research on what the extent of this epidemic is. And the Swinburne research, I don't think it's worth very much. 
Okay, and there's one ARC grant, Australian Research Council grant for those of you not at universities, starting on 2020 on social prescribing. This is the thing that's going to cure loneliness in Australia because GPs are going to socially <laughs> prescribe. So they're not going to give you pills or codeine or anything like that, as we know. They are going to say, look, behind the surgery, there's this piece of dirt. Will you make a garden? <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is, this is how it's defined in this, this ALC thing. So it's back to doctors now being given the uh, responsibility to prescribe social cures to issues of loneliness, as in doing the garden in the surgery, but that's the example. So um, I know a, a colleague of mine, I'm going to talk about his work later, is doing a thing on loneliness in international students, but that hasn't started yet either. So there's no research. There was a little bit of a burst of research in the early 2000s. Some of you might know Michael Flood's work on masculinity. He did a um, piece of research on men and loneliness. And the whole sort of sh men's sheds came out around then. Um, and the whole issue then was men are neglected, be become lonely, post-retirement, etc., etc. Okay, so moving along, uh, obviously my argument is that loneliness is a structural issue, not an individual issue. This is not to negate the fact that people who, you know, maybe get divorced or are going through grief um, can feel loneliness, but in many ways it's a structural issue. Um, this in the 2016 census, there were 2.3 million single-person households, which is 25% of all households. ABS projections are that 2041, between 3 and 3.5 single-person households, which is quite a lot. So why is loneliness increasing? Well, clearly um, we have issues about the changes in the way we work and the way we live people working from home um, because technology is, is allowing that, people traveling lots and distances uh, to the job, um, competitive, very much competitive workforce, the collegial collective employment in a sense has, has disappeared. As some of you might wonder if it was ever there, I guess. A quarter of all private dwellings have only one person in them and family connections have changed drastically. I mean, and all this, in a sense, is about globalization and in terms of jobs, like the movement of global, capi global capital around the world. And so you can just shut down a factory in Wollongong and open one somewhere else very quickly. So where is the neighborhood gone? Where is the community? Um, and, you know, there's, there's really big questions about that. Um, I'm also going to argue that there's a rise of the wellness industry and I've just come from a conference on making community connections with the local community services association mob and of course they had a whole thing on wellness. Um, I'm very skeptical of the wellness industry because in many ways it encourages us to self-regulate, to police ourselves, to go to the gym, to go for a walk, to go for a swim. All these things are going to deal with our emotional health or our loneliness issues. Um, and that's where the wellness industry is, is making a few bucks. Um, social media. Social media is blamed a lot. I'm not sure how much we blame social media. But Instagram and Facebook, I think there is research out which does conclude that actually, you know, uh, scrolling through your Facebook can actually make you feel worse rather than better. And um, I think there's some good evidence about that. It doesn't give us more security or permanence, which is not to say I don't do that myself. I do. Um, and we all do it. But there is a lot of concern about social media. And of course, economic and technological change. I mean, my people I get home care offer, who are not <laughs> sophisticated, or, well, it's Australian Unity, but they're, was it Australian Unity or somebody else, talking about robots will be replacing our care workers in the very near future. And I'm sure that's going to be true. 
And that is just horrific, because for many disabled elderly people, the only people they see ever are care workers. OK, um, I don't know what limited time is. I don't know why I put it there, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to, c oh. I've got 10 minutes. Right, OK, zip, zip. My argument is that neoliberal reforms and ideologies with an emphasis on the free market have led to categories of disempowered people whose health and social needs are subordinated to the market. So just about everything that we need, uh, people, you know, whether they're migrants, whether they're elderly people, disabled people, etc., um, the free market is going to provide. And of course, NDIS is a major example of that. Um, the growth of loneliness and mental health epidemics can be seen not as individual failings cured by therapeutic and drug interventions, but as a result of structural violence by the state. And this is my argument, and the state acts in the interests of capital and the market, practices, and I love, <laughs> don't love, but I think these are amazing titles, from Dillard and Ruckler, 2005, Administrative Evil. <laughs> And Alan Morris, friend and colleague, communicide, as in destroying communities, as in Miller's Point, etc. Um, so I'm going to use two examples, public housing tenants and disabled people over 65 in the NDIS. So most of you, there's a great film, and if you can get it from Wollongong U University, it, um, it hasn't been premiered in Wollongong, and I know Blue Lucerne, who's the director, would love to show it down here, and it's called Eviction. So if you haven't seen Eviction, it's about Miller's Point and um, Sirius, and about the people who were forcibly evicted. So I'm sure you know about that, but in, in essence, it was a democratically elected government acting in a very dictatorial manner, that basically moved everybody out of Miller's Point and Sirius. And the last person to leave Sirius was a 97-year-old woman who was blind and she refused to go. And the profits being made by the neoliberal government were at the expense of the health of tenants. Um, this is fantastic, but you can't buy it because it's cost fortune because it's Springer, but probably in, <laughs> well, you can buy it if you've got a fortune. Um, gentrification, displacement, the forced relocation of public housing tenants in Sydney. That's by Alan Morris, and he's charted the whole um, eviction process and worked with the tenants the whole time. And there's at least four or five suicides now can be absolutely put down to the forced eviction. Because people have basically ended up all over the state, mostly elderly people. In Miller's Point, if you know Miller's Point, it was a very close, vibrant community. People sort of hung over balconies and talked to each other. And it had been there in generations of, of um, maritime workers, basically. People's grandparents and so on lived in Miller's Points. So it was a whole memory that was being wiped away, as well as, you know, people's houses. So... Um, yeah, so that is a clear example of the violence of the neoliberal state causing loneliness because now these people are writing in to, to my friend with stories of how they go into the shop in wherever they're living now and they say hello and nobody says hello back and they just feel desperate to get back to the inner city. The apartments are now mainly Airbnb. The second example is disabled people over 65 years in the NDIS. I, uh, I haven't got it. Oh, maybe I have got it. I found something I wrote in 2000, and I thought, ooh, that works. So there was a report in 2000 called Mutual Obligation, and it was known as the McClure Report, if any of you remember that. And this is what I wrote at the time. It was explored as a means of reducing access to disability rights. Previous welfare reforms had significantly reduced the number of people on unemployment payments, new start, which of course is nothing new now. In the meantime, however, there had been a massive increase in people, particularly women, seeking and gaining invalidity benefits such as the DSP. This crisis required careful attention to policies that would include disabled people in the disciplinary regimes of state welfare without opening up the government to major criticism. Welcome to the NDIS. I 
fervently oppose the NDIS. I fervently oppose Bill Shorten. And the disability movement was basically sucking up to him, saying, oh, great, individual payments. And I was saying, yes, but it's driven by the market, not the state. You're going to get stuffed over. And of course, it is stuffing people over. And it's a gravy train for professionals and the corporate. You know, like Australian Unity running home care throughout Sydney now. And they're paying people less. They've cut down their um, travel allowance, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the NDIS is not um, a good piece of legislation. And there's all the problems with people who are getting it too. But it's basically about structural violence. If you're over 65, I don't know where I've got this. Oh, here we are. This is the impact. If you're, over, if you're 65 and over, you're not eligible to access the NDIS. If you're age 65 and over and you currently receive disability support, you will not be disadvantaged. This is on the NDIS page. You will continue to receive support, supports that achieve similar outcomes to those you currently receive. Right, so we're not going to be disadvantaged. This is my list. I only made it whenever last night. I'm sure there's a list twice as long as this somewhere else. So they're left at the mercy of aged care services, which have little expertise in disability, disability rights and disability movement. Deaf people over 65 have lost all their access to interpreters because they're in a package for the NDIS. So if you can't go out and you can't actually relate to people who don't learn sign or whatever or can't speak sign, you can't afford interpreters you've had it it's just amazing uh, newly acquired impairments people over 65 referred to my age care people with sort of you know high level quads age care supplement is if you get it is worth less than 50 percent of the ndis it sounds small but community buses are free for ndis recipients not for aged care disabled people and, and the list goes on and on. Radio print handicap, you might not even know of this radio station, but it, it reads the newspapers at 8 o'clock in the morning. And it's something that blind people just have on the, all the time because it gives them important information. And they've, their grant's been cut because they're a community. They are not providing community services. They're providing individual packages, which is something I posed way back in 2000. So I think those are two examples of you know, um, structural violence by the state um, causing loneliness. Miller's Point and Sirius, the impact of forced displacement. So these are some quotes from some of the tenants out of Alan's book. Um, the most common thing we find from people that have been moved is loneliness. That's a bigger crime than having, say, a mobility problem, because a mobility problem, you can get help in a way, but loneliness, nothing fixes that except your community, friends and neighbors. I mean, that's the most common complaint. They don't know anyone where they go. And then from Janet, this place, her apartment, is hands down a million percent on Miller's Point. But I'm isolated, yeah, very isolated. You know, a single one without kids, I'm in a really mumsy family environment where I feel I don't have a place. <laughs> uh, and this is from Diane if relocation is a very long process that's for sure in the meantime I just get more and more depressed living out here where nobody comes to visit and my right knee does not like me driving and I cannot afford to drive I'm so depressed beyond belief thanks for your concern cheers Diane then later she wrote the loneliness is beyond my mental capacity capability I have spent so much money here and I have tried so hard to meet people around this area and tried so hard beggars can't be choosers so hard I just can't take it anymore that's pretty sad stuff so this is sort of what's considered sort of con the contemporary response and this is not a bad book lost connections the real causes of depression but really it's individualized so, you know, what you are recommended to do is reconnect with other people, find meaningful work, find meaningful values, find sympathetic joy in yourself and overcome your addiction to self, acknowledge and overcome your childhood trauma and restore the future. I mean, 
all very well, but doesn't do much for Diane out in Whoop Whoop. And also, it's actually very hard to do if you find yourself, um, you know, um, in a disconnected state. Whoa, have I done it? Okay, so neoliberalism is creating loneliness. That's what's wrenching society apart. There are plenty of secondary reasons for this distress. This is from George Mon Monbiot um, from The Guardian. There are plenty of secondary reasons for this distress, but it seems to me that the underlying cause is everywhere the same. Human beings, the ultra-social mammals, whose brains are wired to respond to other people, are being peeled apart. Economic and technological change play a major role, but so does ideology. Through, though our well-being is inextricably linked to the lives of others everywhere, we are told that we will prosper to, and this is my underlining, competitive self-interest and extreme individualism. So it's a pretty depressing conclusion. I mean, I have got another paper which goes into solutions and ways forward, but I can't do it in 20 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to. No. to um, that was. Yeah. Excellent and depressing. I'm sorry, it was depressed. Needs a new analysis. Uh, I have to do the analysis. Thank you very much. I was much. in university. How good Alan stuff? Oh, I haven't stuff is good. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank and has, I'm just going to do a really short intro so that you can get started, um, is a senior lecturer from the Faculty of Business. Her research area is accounting and accountability um, and social justice. I love the linking of the, the um, accounting, which I would um, perhaps not associate with social justice. So um, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, maybe I should introduce myself a little bit. Why accounting related to what the research I'm doing now? Accounting, I think a lot of people will think that it's just number crunching, but actually it's not. About accountability and also providing information for better decision as well. So this is the area that I love to do. So this is not the first project, it's related to social justice. In the past, I've done research about uh, the center link overpayment net, which Michael is here, <laughs> from Legal Aid. He used to work with Legal Aid. This is the project that I always like to do. So this is an, another project that I've done last year. So the report has been done, and some of you may have listened to my presentation earlier. Hope that is, it won't bore you too much. I'll give you some details of what we have done. So our research is um, hard to reach with the NDIS experience in Wollongong. We've done a small uh, research. Our um, interview has only got 32, but the database is coming from um, St. Vincent de Paul. It's a collaboration between UOW, our faculty, and Vinis. And that's our team member. It's not only my work, but with my team as well. And what I'm going to talk about today is the background of this research and also what we have done, the method and the data, what we found and our recommendations. So NDI, as we know, that is brought out in Wollongong area since 2017. And also because of my background, I work full time at uni, but my spare time, I do some volunteer works. I'm still doing it with St. Vincent de Paul. What I did is doing home visits for those who really need, especially um, um, they need help for just sim as simple as food. So they make emergency calls and then we'll go and visit them mm -hmm. and check out what problem they have. And also we give vouchers. Basically it's food vouchers and medical help them with paying with medical bills. So when I talk to them, usually we are allowed at least 20 to 30 minutes for each client of Vinis when they call out. We, we won't just give out vouchers, but we'll talk to them. Loneliness definitely is a major problem. A lot of people with, uh, in Wollongong area, that you'll be surprised how many of them have never been talking with anyone. They're just sitting at home and they don't have any money just to pay for the basic bills. So we visit them, we talk to them, and then give me the ideas of doing this research. A number of the clients in Wollongong area uh, they actually uh, are on the DSP because when we interview them, when we visit them, we have some records. 
So privacy, we won't record any uh, details, but at least we know what type of services they have been provided before we help them. So I realized a number of them on the DSP, and I was surprised. And I asked them, start to ask them some simple questions such as, are uh, you aware of the NDIS? Do you know that if you have a disability, you may get extra help? And this is how. <laughs> 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 yeah. So this is another problem as well. So my aim of this research is to investigate the impact of the NDIS. This is what I start with. I thought that it's been rolled out for some time. NDIS, even though it's fairly new in New South Wales, but a lot of TV ads and commercials, TV commercials, I thought that a lot of people will be aware of the NDIS. So that's why I thought that maybe I'll do some research to see how many people are getting benefit, how effective of this NDIS in the region, and how well the process of the NDIS are understood by the people with disabilities and their carers, what type of assistance that they required, and identify their areas to improve the NDIS. That's what we started with. But once we've I've done the questions, get the ethic clearance, and started to interview the clients. We find that a lot of them actually have never heard of the NDIS. So, give, give you some background. Venice, um, they assisted people in the Wollongong region, it's around 3,022 people, and in 2018, it's around 110. But I can tell you that in 2019, when I do the interview, I don't do it every week. I just occasionally, maybe, more maximum every fortnight. I will find that the number of people with a disability on DSP is increasing. The people that's been assisted by Venice, more and more people with disabilities getting help from Venice. So again, but because we've just finished the project, without ethics clearance, I can't ask too much. But you can see that the number has been increasing a lot. And we've done semi-structured interviews. We have some set questions, and then we'll guide them to talk about what their experiences of their disability and the NDIS. Is there any help, or do you aware of the NDIS? So we have 32 interviewees, and um, we're very grateful that St. Vincent de Paul help us to contact the clients because uh, for UOW, as a researcher, we can't contact the clients alone, so we have to get all the ethics approval from the university, as well, from, as, well as from Venice itself as well. And these are the profile of the interviewees. You see that a number of them is in the age group of 45 to 54, the majority of our interviewees. And I think we, have to, we, are, we can encounter some um, same issues with our clients' group. I've interviewed myself, most of the clients I interviewed myself. When I talk to them, are you aware of the NDIS? First of all, some of them will tell me that, yes, I have applied, but they're trying to encourage me to go for the age pension instead. So even though you ask for help for the NDIS, but they're saying that, oh, maybe you should apply for the age pension instead of the NDIS. Even though they're not even close to 65. Some of them, no, when they are 50 something, over 55, they already encourage you to apply for age pension, not the NDIS. Imagine if you are in that group, and personally, I have my sister-in-law in that age group, been applying for a few years now and still couldn't get any help. So this is something that is ongoing issue, especially with this group. And you look at their accommodation status, most of them are living with the government housing, some of them with the private rental, and a majority, or oh, sorry, 20% of them are in temporary accommodations. Some of them will be living in um, near North Wollongong, you know, those are temporary accommodations, Piccadilly. Does anyone of you ever been to those areas? Mm -hmm. Those rooms are so small. We interview them, even when we do normal visits, we'll go into their room, Sometimes it's just hardly to find a seat to have to sit on their bed to have the interview. So that's what they have to live day to day, one place to the other. This week I may be visiting them in City Surf Motel. Next week, Piccadilly, or some other day will be any other places. And it's also paid by the government as well. And you know how much they charge as well? A lot of money. I think the minimum is 75 per, per night. So no matter it's a short, even though you rent for a week, you still have to pay for that rent. Imagine if you have a disability. 
and these are the primary disability of the interviewees. So a lot of them have spinal cord injuries, they may have some car accident, some of them were drivers, but for some accidents happened, they couldn't work anymore. It's not that they don't want to work. When we interview them, they say always that if there's a job that can allow them to work for part-time, it will be great. But because of their disability, they could not work full-time. And they don't really want to rely too much on the government help as well. And some of them have um, sort of psychosocial disability and autism, heart disease, different types of disability that we've been interviewed with this group. And when we ask for, when most of them when you apply for NDIS, they only ask for your primary disability. But when we ask for deeper questions, they will tell you that actually half of them, if they have a disability, they have some sort of mental problem as well. We suspect that they've been isolated for a long period of time or because of their illness, that's why they create much, much more problems, much more complex issues than just have the basic disability. So I think this is the government have been overlooked. They thought that ah, we were just helping someone that broke his leg or got some issue they can't walk, but the isolations, especially this group of people, they don't have any friends. After looking at the profiles, we're looking for the themes as well. When we are doing the uh, interviews, we recorded all our, we get the permission for, from our clients, and then we recorded it, and with all of our, the team of five, we look through all the interviews, transcripts, and then pick up the themes. So we double check with each other's file as well, and these are the main themes that we've come up with. The first one is the awareness of the NDIS, the understanding of the NDIS, the source of information about the NDIS, support structures and types of support that they need. So this is an area that we are trying to look at. So from our group, 19% are on the NDIS. 9% applied and not successful. So it's include those who try to apply and they said that you should go for the age pension. And 28%, they're not even aware of the NDIS. And 44% of them, they are aware of the NDIS, but did not apply. I'm not the NDI agent, NDIA. I can't say that they're eligible or not, but based on the fact that they're on the DSP and within the age group, so we assume that they should be eligible for the NDIS. So understanding of the NDIS, when we ask them questions, what do you know about the NDIS? Surprisingly, there's a big gap between those who appear to be eligible of the NDIS and their knowledge about the NDIS. We thought that if they have a disability, having Centrelink payment, they should know something about the NDIS, right? It's for them. But most of the clients that we interviewed do not have the skills to apply. When we ask them why you're not applying, they can't even log onto the computer. Some of them you can't even afford to have a TV. You, I would th think that having a TV at home would be something that's quite basic especially uh, someone who was sitting at home all the time with a disability, but you'll be surprised that some of them just don't bother to do anything. They are just looking forward for our visit, because usually we, have, we stay for around, as I said, 20 to 30 minutes. They're just happy to talk, talk to you, the loneliness. And they do not have a clear understanding of what is NDIS. Some of them telling us that, oh, is it the NDIS provide us with accommodations, or is it giving us um, transportation fees, so they don't have a clear understanding of what it is. And some of them will think that uh, probably may not be even eligible for it. So the reason of not applying, they do not have the skills to apply. They say that it's just too much. Applying for Centrelink payment is already difficult enough. NDIS, so many forms to fill, so many things to read, and uh, their application rejected, or they think that they don't need NDIS. So this is another surprising fact. I thought that if you have a disability for whatever reasons, you think that NDIS will be helping them. But because, as I mentioned earlier, half of them will also have mental problem. So they don't even think that they need help, extra help from the government. And you know, they're not sure if they're eligible, or sometimes even the doctor because when they apply for the NDIS, they may need the support from their doctors as well. The doctors just find it too complicated to help them to fill in a form or can't verify all the details. They just 
brush it off, and that's it. And some of them's not even interested. The source of information, when we ask them, where do you heard of the NDIS? I think some of them is from their service providers, only minimum group, a number of them are on some form of help, like disability trust. Most of them have a disability, but have no other support. They've heard from the TV, family and friends, but 28% have no information at all. In terms of support groups, so I think this one is really important. A number of them, the majority of them, have no friends and families. So all they have is isolation, loneliness in the region. Living in a government housing area, but they just seldom go out and talk to anyone. They rely on the charities, community service, for example, Vinnie's um, uh, Salvation Army, those are the basic ones. And service providers, 16%. Those with families, only 12% of the interviewees, they have a support group. So the impact of the NDIS of, of those that we interviewed, as we can see that basically is minimum, minimum impact of the NDIS with this group of people. Even though some of them are on the NDS already, they're not satisfied with the plan. They say that um, they don't really see the difference or it's very hard to choose because now you have to choose all the supports that you get, those providers. So you need to know what you want before you can get some help. But with this group, this really vulnerable group, they don't have friends, they don't have any support. And for us, even when I'm um, going to visit them, we can't provide much information. We can only give them leaflet, because I'm not an expert. There are a lot of volunteers from Venice who are not experts with their NDIS. So they really rely on the government to help them. What they really need is, when we ask them, so what type of support, if we can get, give you more help with the NDIS, what are you expecting? These are the things that they are looking for. The cost of living, for example, as simple as paying for their rent, food. Some of them just left with no money after paying rent. Or because of their disability, they have to pay for a lot of medical bills. And also a secure place to live in as well. Among the 32 of our interviewees, three of them report to us that they've been robbed twice in three months three of them, so some 10% of our interviewees, they just broke into their house, get everything, so they can left them with nothing. So they just want to have a secure place to stay in. Transportation provides skills to get a job. They hope to get some home care and some modifications to home. So th there's some basic human needs. It's not even for something really super fancy, just food to fill their stomach. And these answers reflect that these individuals have limited knowledge of the NDIS and what it can and cannot provide. Conclusions. We're trying to identify some ways to improve the NDIS. For example, can it be uh, promoted through Centrelink? We've asked the questions, why can't Centrelink provide more information to NDIS? Because we thought that most of them are already on the DSP. Why can't Centrelink provide information or contact those with a problem and provide them services? They said that there's two different organizations, so they're not linked, so they can't do it. And then arrange information sessions beyond those of, uh, having uh, those services providers and provide training for support workers and carers and take into consideration of the diversity of disability, especially when we see that a majority of people with a disability may have psycho, uh, social problem as well. And clarification of the criteria of eligibility, especially in mental health as well. I think today, I think uh, the NDI has just released the eligibility, make it as a big list as well. When I look at it, I have a headache. <laughs> just as receive this. Imagine if you have a problem but looking at, at those eligibility criteria, probably I'll just close my book <laughs> and that's it. So thank you very much.
question to the end. I'm sure people I'm sure people have some questions and comments for Wendy at the end. I can see there's a few disability um, support services and people from um, the sector here who I'm sure will have some, some things to say. Um, I'd, li I'd like to now um, introduce Philip Crawford. Um, when we were initially brainstorming um, this session, um, I, I said, oh, wouldn't it be great to get Philip Crawford from Vallon to Enfinity to come along? And Sean said, why don't we just ask him? And he did come. <laughs> so um, I'm really, really excited to introduce um, Philip. He um, works for an arts company called Beyond Empathy. Beyond Empathy collaborates with communities across Australia to shift perceptions and generate positive social change through the process of creating and sharing art. Um, building on his experience as a community worker, Phil has for many years collaborated with people who would never normally be involved in the process of art making using film and digital media. Um, and he's won a whole lot of awards for different things um, that he has done, different films that he's made. And I, I imagine that as Illawarra locals, most of you will have seen um, at least one of his productions. So I'll, um, I'll pass the mic over. Do you need me to get something up on the screen? Thank you. Uh, no, I'm going to move over here if I can. Alrighty, is that all good? Um, yeah, well thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to show you a few videos because it's much more interesting than listening to me talk. Um, and so I'm going to start, we uh, often work in, um, you know, I guess with the kind of communities that um, we were just talking about. So we're, Beyond Empathy has often worked with um, people in public housing estates and what have you. But we were really lucky a couple of years ago to have the opportunity to work in a, di like in a different way with a different community. And so we started working with some people um, of all abilities, but particularly those who don't use verbal language as their main way to communicate. Um, and in the end, we um, produced a, a work, an event, um, which was called Blue Rose. It was held it's been held twice at the Merigong Theatre Company helped to host it. And so I'm just going to show you the little video which was made. It's made from a news story and some other footage to give you an idea about what this, what was actually done in this project. Eleven-year-old Gracie Wallace has a smile that could brighten any room, and that's exactly what she's doing this week at the Illawarra Performing Arts Centre. It's really hard to express how or moving and special. Oh, just gonna. Whoop. Revered. Gracie's one of the many stars in the Beyond Empathy Blue Rose installation, a unique interactive way for people of all abilities. To look at the film. She needs it to be a more interactive and more tactile experience. Oh, the spaceship through that room—that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Just how interactive it is with the fans and the moving and the noise and everything like that. Gosh, when you, when you sit in that seat and you push that handle down, and that that whoosh of um, air comes out you—you you really feel like you're going into space. And the other room. Um, to be able to see one of those mosquito nets and just have the projections of the light and sound and everything's really incredible as well. I even got to see it once with my daughter, you know, seeing yourself on the screen and then when do you ever get a moment where you know, you're, seeing it, you're seeing your face on a big screen and then you look down and then you've got film on the floor and then you've got film up here and then you've got film going around there. But what's probably meant the most is actually seeing the impact on different people coming through and not just the impact on the individuals and having the experience but also for the people that were there well, I think for the, the community who haven't been exposed to uh, people with disabilities before, I think they can understand that there's different ways of communicating. Uh, this is through a sensory experience, a tactile experience. Toby and Gemma um, came to our house and 
um, looked at Gracie in her own sensory environment and some of the ideas that they've implemented are actually directly from what we do in Gracie, which has just been amazing. The cocoons and the nets are um, Gracie's thing and it's extraordinary to see other people enjoying what she enjoys. The goal of really being in the Blue Rose Project is for the community to see. Don't pity Lily when she walks down the street and celebrate her because she's got a great story to tell. She does communicate, it's just in a different kind of way. I think that people who communicate verbally probably miss out on a lot of things um, that people who don't communicate verbally are experiencing. It's probably something that we will never fully be able to comprehend but by having experiences like this, it's just a little bit of an insight into a different way of thinking and a different way of hearing and touching and um, interacting with the world. So I think that's a really um, good way to, to sort of um, educate the community and, and make them more aware and, and also for, for people with disability as well to sort of like become more integrated into the community as well and sort of, you know, um, have a voice without having to necessarily speak, which has been great. Yeah, so like the starting point for that was we, we came in to do a project working with digital media with people who are not using verbal languages that necessarily their main way to communicate. And we started working with people who we linked up with through parents or through organisations like the Cram Foundation or the Disability Trust. And very early on, of course, we went, well, there's a certain, quite a high proportion of the people who were involved in the project who don't watch films and videos. So, well, they don't watch them in the same way. Um, they have a different way of interacting. And so eventually we went, you know, there's not much point in producing this stuff if the people who are, we're collaborating with won't necessarily enjoy the experience of having it projected somewhere. Um, and so we were very lucky to be able to work with this digital designer in order to create a more sensory way of kind of looking at film. But anyway, I might take you back now, sort of that's like seeing what we sort of did. Um, but to back to the what, like why it was called Blue Rose, because that's probably a really good question. Um, and so a little bit back to my own experience. So the next, the video that I'm going to show you um, is about my sister. And we produced this, um, like really when we were just starting and trying to think about this project. Um, and... What you're going to hear, you'll see images of my sister, uh, Linda, um, from when we were kids. Uh, and there's a voiceover that's done by my son. Um, and so this probably gives you a bit of a uh, insight into some of the thinking that we, we started with. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, what we were trying to do with the installation as well, once you've had a watch of this. My older sister has blue eyes and brown hair. She often guides her own hands and draws little patterns on them with her fingers. Sometimes she goes into a funny little dance. says she's like a blue rose. It was summertime. She had come home from the hospital. They were happy. They talked about the years ahead. How she would grow up, learn to walk, to talk, go to school. And then later I'll be a grown up and get married. But as she grew, things were different. She didn't do things the same as other kids did. She moved differently. She looked at you differently. She made sounds differently. And one day the doctor said to them, she's mentally retarded. 
You could consider sending her to a home. But they wouldn't consider it. Mum says they started to think that she was in a world which we might not feel completely at home in. To go there might be like going to another planet. Maybe it's as if she is standing behind a screen, a screen we can't see. Maybe it has beautiful colours that distract her at times from paying attention when we talk to her. Maybe she listens to music we can't hear. Maybe that's why she jumps up at times and goes into a funny dance. Dad says fish have a language and a music of their own. A language and music that is carried by the waves. But we can't hear it because our ears are not good enough. She is happy a lot of the time and Papa says she must be laughing at the ridiculousness of things. But sometimes she seems to be more alone. She looks troubled and puzzled. Maybe in these moments she understands things I will never understand. She's like a blue rose. And because there aren't that many blue roses, we don't know much about them. But what could we learn if we took the time to try and walk around in the shoes of someone who might look different, who might play differently, who might not speak our language, and try to understand their beauty and the greatness of their thoughts. said what could we learn if we took the time to try and walk around in the shoes of someone who might look different, who might play differently, who might not speak our language and try to understand their beauty and the greatness of their thoughts. Um, yeah, so Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so when I was a kid, like uh, I'm next under Linda. Linda's my older sister. And so when I was really little, um, she was just my playmate. Like we were, you know, we were just on the same level. So my earliest memories of um, interacting with Linda was, you know, we played chasings or like crawled all around the place. And, you know, so th I had no, like I, I still sort of carry that feeling, I think, in my sort of, bones that I just don't, I didn't see, there were, she was just Linda. So I didn't perceive any sense of difference about her to anybody else. Um, so, but of course that doesn't last. Um, by the time I got to school, I was very conscious of the fact that people viewed Linda as being somebody who was really different. And I, one of the things that I thought about a lot when we were doing this project and then what were we trying to do by doing that installation work was I just because even as a little kid I felt uncomfortable when I went around places it wasn't because of Linda but it was because of the way other people reacted when we went anywhere with Linda and I think about it like that um, it always felt like people are turning away like wherever we went <laughs> because people weren't trying to be mean, but they just weren't looking straight at you because Linda would make, she communicated differently. So people didn't know what to do. So they were just looking away. But I felt that when I was a kid. Um, and then I thought about it, like just thinking it later on and going, but what, what must that be like for Linda? Like she's now 
what am I, nearly 55, so she's nearly 58. But she's had her whole life of go anywhere that she goes, people like turning away. And, you know, there's, uh, so sometimes when I think about it, like, you know, she doesn't use words to communicate, but there's quite a lot of times where um, you go like emotionally, like I just go like her emotional language, though I don't fully understand it, it may well be developed in a way that I'm not fully comprehending. Like I, I'll just give you an example. My father died uh, maybe, so 2010, so quite a, f a few years ago now. And when he passed away, we, we, we visited him in hospital. He died of cancer. And we, Linda came in with us to visit him. But he had one of those moments. It was a few days before he died and he was really alert. And she came on that day. It was fantastic. Um, and we, I, I talked to, you know, we talk, my, my brothers and I talked to Linda about what was happening. But then after he passed away in the hospital, we went together to go and visit her and tell her what had happened. Um, and there's no, like, there's no obvious reaction that she, Linda was going to give to us. Um, and we didn't expect one. But when it came to, you know, a week or so later when we went to the funeral, Linda often will not, like if she go, if she was here today, she'd be like, it's stuff you feel, I'm not listening to this shit. She'd be out the door, you know, she, <laughs> she, well, no, she'd eat all the biscuits. She'd want a cup of tea, that would get her to sit down for a while, but she just wouldn't be interested in that. And so oftentimes if you go anywhere, she's just be searching around for things that she could interact with, you know, her sensory sort of things. But at the funeral, on the day of the funeral, she, we went to the cemetery first and she was com like, compl it was like a completely different mood. And then the service for my father, which went for like two hours, it was a mammoth thing. She sat in the church where we were at and she didn't move for like two hours. And I, that was one of those moments where I go like, she just knew, she knew in her spirit, you know what I mean? With it, it's not in words. Anyway, it's in something different. Anyway, when we were doing the installation thing, I, what, what I, because, you know, it was fun making the film stuff and it was fun having it in a way where people could come and interact. But I was kind of more interested in what does that possibility of having that, what does that, what opportunity is there in that? And the opportunity, it seemed to me, is that could we make, could we do two, sort of two things? Could we create an environment where people, like where, when people would come in, everybody would turn towards them instead of away. So that's what we tried to do. We had a massive set of volunteers. And when anyone, well, it doesn't matter what their abilities was. I mean, everyone who came in, everyone was greeted. Everyone was talked to. Everybody was introduced to other people. If they spoke or not, didn't matter. There was lots of words. There was lots of gestures. There was lots of eye contact that was made um, and I found that very powerful. It was like a, it was only one day, two days, but it was really, yeah, felt um, amazing to be part of something like that. And then I think, what did that also mean to, um, yeah, to the people having that experience? I'd, I'll just relate like one, it's, it's kind of by having, because I think, it, like there was one family who came in, it was like the, they came, there was a gentleman who didn't use verbal language as his main way to communicate. He probably was in his 30s or 40s, I don't know. He came with his, his family, like his mother and father and his um, pro probably younger sister maybe and her, her husband or fiance, like I didn't really talk to them. But they came into the space and then they, they spent, they probably spent an hour and a half like moving all around this kind of area. And I just, like they just had so much fun. And he was clearly delighted with the whole thing. But what had also occurred to me was that oftentimes, like even for my sister, you know, like she, we, she's all, we, we do things together still as a family. We shall come for lunch, we go out for food and what have you. But it's very rarely in an environment that's sort of about her. It's not really on her terms, you know what I mean? Like she's there, but we're all doing our own thing and she's hanging around. And for that family, I could just imagine, it's probably a similar thing like that, that gentleman. But here, everybody, they were there to have an experience that was more sort of on his terms um, and it was very exciting.
um, to be part of that whole process. And I think, so I, when I saw the title of this thing about um, loneliness and belonging, it just got me thinking, that's what I think, you know, I was thinking about. It was what's that experience like for people who are not using words? Like what loneliness is there? And then what things can we do in the community that are going to address that? I mean, there's been tremendous, you know, like when you, my parents had to do that thing at one stage where not only were they told you could put Linda into a home when she was, you know, five years old, because that was the standard thing, but then when the Richmond re report was written in New South Wales and they were closing all the institutions, um, there were no places for people to move into. And so Linda was offered a, a spot at, she was 19 maybe, 18 or 19, at Rydalmere Psychiatric Hospital. <laughs> and so they had to say again, you know, no, that's not appropriate. And Linda came, you know, li Linda lived at home until she got her thing. Anyway, we've come a long way since then. But yeah, I, I think there's great, anyway, there's great potential for us to have more of those sort of interactions. I'm just going to show you a couple of other nice videos since I've talked for an, uh, enough time. Um, how, how am I going for time? Um, yeah, five minutes. Five minutes? Cool. <laughs> um, I just, it was, this is just really cute, really. Um, Oh, no, wrong one. I'm searching in the wrong place. <laughs> searching in the wrong place. Um, so, Luke was one of the kids who we met in the project. And one of the things where, when we've done these sort of projects before, we involve people who are working collaboratively with us. You know, they often, they get to hold the camera. You know, it's not like we're trying to create a, you know, we do the filming and you don't touch the stuff. But anyway, it was a little bit more difficult in this project to know sort of how that would work. But anyway, I really like this video because it's um, showing Luke at his, there's a park in Coromel that's named after Luke because his parents have been very active in um, promoting opportunities and creating, um, ad, like being advocates for people of all abilities. Um, and so this park was created with him in mind. And so we went there to film with him and we set up various cameras. We were using cameras, but anyway, we were using a GoPro. And so I just liked this film because in the end, he takes control of the camera <laughs> and you'll see what happens. He plays with his own shadow, so that's what all that's about. He's like looking at his shadow and interacting with his own shadow.
No worries. Hey, thank you very much. Um, would I be able to get every um, the speakers and Lucy and Helen to come come up, um, and and just start by um, saying thank you to all of you. I mean, what a it was actually a really cohesive um, panel and ended. It was wonderful to end with um, coming back to that kind of belonging as well, which. Um, which um, Helen posed as a real problem at the beginning, and I think I think we really kind of worked worked through there a bit. Um, does anyone have a question or a comment um, at this point? Yeah. Um, can I? Should I? Mic that over there. Yeah. Oh, you don't. No, but you can do them. Are you okay with the voice? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, all three of you. I have a, a question for you. Um, I wanted to know if Linda s saw your installation and what she thought of it. Um, no, <laughs> she didn't see the installation. Um, and she hasn't watched the film because Linda is one of those people who, like she doesn't watch telly, she doesn't like look at pictures or whatever in the same way as you or I. Um, so I've told her about it, <coughs> um, and she lives up in Sydney. So, no, it's a, I would have loved for her to to get her down here, and maybe next time with her NDIS support, she'll be able to come. Yeah. But yeah. Another question. Um, I just have a question for Helen about the NDIS and what you I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. It's okay. You can. Or I'll repeat it. It's okay. I'll just ask the question again into the mic. Yeah. The, the question was around um, Helen's comment about the NDIS as a gravy train, which really resonated with the questioner, and um, and what the alternative would have been. Uh, yes, it is gravy train. Um, just to add to that, give an example, uh, Prince of Wales Hospital, where I live in Sydney, had about 15, 20 OTs mm -hmm. for disabled people, elderly people, etc. My um, my van blew up on Bullet Plus actually, so which had a lift, and so I thought I'll ring my OT and have a chat. Well, I couldn't do that. I had to go on myagecare.com and refer get a GP to refer me. Blah, 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 blah. Three months later, she rang me and I said, oh, "I thought I'm going to see you again," and she said, "I'm the last person left." South, West, South, East, Sydney, she covers, and she's retiring. I said, what's happened? Well, I sort of knew. They've all gone private. It is a gravy train. Um, so not only is it problematic and people don't apply and people are rejected and all this stuff, capital, it's a transfer of money and funds from the taxpayer to capital via the state. I can't put it any simpler than that. And, you know, then we'll be told by the state that there isn't enough money for whatever. And that's because it's a gravy train. And I am totally appalled. Um, carry on with my story. <laughs> Just, I went to buy a Subaru. And uh, welcome to NDIS provider, Subaru. Woolworths, you know, it'll be everywhere next. Everybody is a provider because everybody's on the gravy train. Private social workers, private OTs. I actually think it's unconscionable for anybody working in social and health services to go private like this. I mean, it, you know, they're charging hundreds of dollars an hour and there's nobody left in the public sector. God knows what you do about that. Um, I'm much... Uh, what I didn't say, which is also really important, is that 
NDIS is exempt from the Age Discrimination Act and the Disabled Disability, uh, sorry, Disability Discrimination Act. Both. It's written in. So we're stuffed. I mean, what do we do? Who the f do we take to court, you know? So they've got us by the short and curlies, basically. Um, for that's people over 65. Um, and people are really suffering now they're moved into my age care. We got a bit of that from a co-presenter. Because there's nothing in my age care, you know? Um, unless you're wealthy. I was totally opposed to individual payments unless, and I tried to explain this, you know, 10 years ago, unless they're on the Californian model. Because individual payments, and they're not individual payments because they're individual payments via the NDAS, via providers. You've got to have a provider for your wheelchair, a provider for your meals, a provider for this, and a provider for that. And most of the providers are privatised corporations like Australian Unity. I mean, we're not talking about St. Vinnie's. We're talking about, you know, multi-million international capital. And I find this appalling. And I find the Labour Party appalling too, by the way. <laughs> Just to throw that in. <laughs> um, I think individual payments worked in California at a particular time, at a particular space, because they were a lump of money passed to an individual and they employed their carers through the local Berkeley RAG, if any of you know Oakland Berkeley around, around that part of the world, and there were lots of students, great people, you know, working, um, sorry, students studying at Berkeley who wanted to be carers. So there was a great community. Um, it was sort of geographically confined, some of it in San Francisco, and there it worked, and people lived in communes. I mean, the stories are fabulous, really, uh, of people living in communes and, and able-bodied and disabled people living together and bands and drama and all that sort of stuff. You'd love it. <laughs> in fact, there's a book I can give you. <laughs> Somebody's just given it to me. It's about a thousand pages long. Um, um, no, I'm absolutely really in favour of community services, you know? Yeah. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> You know, and I don't know how we're going to get rid of this bloody NDIS, really. And the six, I mean, the thing about the people over 65 are beginning to mobilise, right? So there's a page you can go on on Facebook, much as I hate Facebook, called NDIS. And it stands for Not Damn Interested in Seniors. So there's sort of rolling stories of what's happening to people. And it is that administrative evil. And I love that thing. I know it's tough, but it's true. So, yeah, I, I, you know, roll me back to home care New South Wales with all its problems, you know. They had local management committees on which disabled people sat and said, you know, well, we're a bit worried about these people or what's happening or the payments or whatever. It was community controlled. How the hell do we get back to community control? God only knows. You know, we've rolled so far into neoliberalism. Um, look, I, I think the future only lies, and I'm talking about across the sweep of what we're facing, really, in social movements coming back, and they are coming back in terms of, you know, young people and climate change and so on. Um, the disability movement is decimated because they became service providers. They sold out to capital and the state. I'm sorry, but they did. Can yeah, I sorry. One, one. Yeah. Let's see if there's any more questions. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. no. I, I appreciate it. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you. That okay. <laughs> I know that other, I can see Lynn wants to ask a question. So I just. I, well, I wanted to ask, um, because we've got disability service providers um, in the room, whether it would actually be worth hearing a response to the same question from a provider who's also trying to adjust to the new NDIS. So I don't yeah, know if you, you wanted you, to add. Could you come up a bit? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Are you still funded by the equity? No. Oh, great. <laughs> no, we've... we've no, we've had some fundraising through BHP. Um, I mean, I think it's a, it's really interesting hearing, uh, you know, what what is working, what is not working, uh, and you know, we hear a lot from the NDIS about the great things. Uh, you know, three hundred thousand Australians now accessing uh, individualised supports, and a uh, hundred thousand of them who 
his, prior to the NDIS being implemented, weren't receiving any funded disability support. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, the idea, the philosophy behind the NDIS. A lot of the things that we've we've touched on in terms of the things that people wanted assistance with, like that um, graphic that you had there, a lot of those things are not NDIS responsibilities. So they're, they're, I think there's, I think it's such a big target. We can just attack the NDIS when a lot of those things, be it transport or psychiatric services or uh, other other areas that were mentioned, they're not actually a, a responsibility of the NDIS. We do need to lean in as a community, as a culture, and and uh, you know I want to see more social movements. I think that we need a strong, vibrant um, disability advocacy uh, community. Um, we want the NDIS to work, and I think we are a long way down the track. What what we do know is that people can if you know only a couple of years ago i remember sitting in in meetings where people needed uh, accommodation services uh, and they were at home with their parents they might have been well into their 40s and 50s with severe uh, intellectual disabilities uh, had never moved out of home parents really you know at death's door uh, and and really the person under under the NDIS that will not happen you know that person will have an entitlement to support to leave home uh, to live with others uh, so long as they're under 65 and that's that's a whole you know there's a there's definitely problems with the NDIS and one of the things that we advocated strongly for is that people with disability and their families are the experts on that person's support needs you know so I think a lot of the planning process is complicated and and will will no doubt be improved over time but I think when I think about the NDIS it's one of the one of the things that I'm really proud of as an Australian uh, that we have gone down this path and I think a lot of the costs historically were really hidden uh, in those state funded systems and you know we've seen OTs and speech pathologists and other people who've moved across uh, under the NDIS and they're now um, they're really uh, performing in a, in a very professional manner. They provide a, an intervention plan to the person that they're going to be supporting. If they've got 10 hours of support in the plan, they'll say, well, this is what I can do. I can run an assessment for you. I can write a report. We can look at the equipment that you need. And that's about all I'm going to be able to give you for 10 hours. And then you'll probably have to go back to your planner and ask for more. Okay. But at least that's a very transparent approach to the, to the funding arrangements. And I suppose... The other thing for us, we are a not-for-profit provider, and I am a I am a believer in the not-for-profit sector. I think there is a danger with um, for-profit providers creeping into the market. Uh, we just saw the NDIS CEO, um, who was a banker before he was the NDIS CEO, uh, he left uh, that job and went straight into an ASX-listed company that's purchasing group homes around Australia. So, so that is that is definitely terrifying. There's aspects of that which which really worry me, and we want to see choice and control, but it's not perfect. But I I think this, mach this, the wheels are moving. People can now move from Albury to Wodonga and not have to renegotiate their um, their support package with a new state provider. Um, so there's lots of good things happening, but we need we need more. Yeah. 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 Um, I presume you you were the handicapped persons trust and you're now disability trust. Is that right? We were a long time. Ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have membership. Yeah, we do. Have so, what do you do with people over sixty-five? Well, we, we there's a thing under, under yeah, well under the NDIS um, and Department of Health. There's people uh, who have continuity of supports uh, through Department of Health. So, if they were receiving uh, funded disability services under state or territory governments, and they're over sixty-five, they still receive and are eligible for those supports. If they got into the NDIS yeah. before, yes, yeah. But if you're now turning 65, yes, it's 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 problematic. Yeah, but I think yeah, I can understand. But this is the problem you see, where all all state and territory uh, departments, be that be it transport, education, health, have to lean in to this issue because, again, w what the NDIS was established for is those 460,000 Australians who are, have a lifelong uh, impairment, and if as soon as you get into that over 65 category, basically that's everybody. So, but pretty much 65 plus, we start to have a severe or profound core activity limitation. It's quite common. So, so I've had a lifelong disability. Yeah. No. So I'd have lived in Geelong yeah. or Newcastle 
I would be in the end yeah. for well, the that, like, yeah. geographic yeah. yeah, right, yeah. sure. And, and, and I mean, yeah. I think it is a sticky issue it is because sticky the, issue. The, yeah. the cutoff does, um, like any aged cutoff, yeah. um, has, has the, it ignores the fact that people with um, a lifelong impairment who are mm. over 65 have different and compounding factors to somebody who acquires an impairment yeah. after yeah. 65, yeah. which yeah. we know is, is assessed as mm. an age-related disability and is quite different. Mm. Um, but, I mean, um, I, I, I think this is a really interesting debate and it is a very hot debate right now yeah. and perhaps also um, suggests a need for a um, ageing and disability um, uh, network meeting um, so that the next one which is, is it, which segues into the work that Lynn and I um, are doing in um, disability and dementia um, and um, but I think it really this is exactly what this forum's for yeah. for these kinds of debates and to raise these issues that are really um, that are sticky yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean they are it's a, constru it's a constructed they're, they're, cons they're constructed holes yeah. Hopefully my voice almost picks it up. It's, it's um, that, those, those gaps, the gaps in that system were known from the start that they were going to exist and they, they have still ploughed ahead with that process. And, those, and the, the state governments effectively said, well, here's my chance. Yeah. All right, we're going to <laughs> we're gonna wash our hands of all of this. Yeah. And in doing so... Those other, those other systems that we're talking about, the transport and so forth, they get to do the same thing. So there isn't any, the, 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 the state governments basically said, we're gonna run for the hills. Yep. And the federal government said, well, we're not gonna look after everything that the state governments did because that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. And then ends up with this and on the other, great gap. On the other hand, on the other side of it, there is also the ageism that's involved and it's in, a in ageism. not just in disability supports, but actually mm -hmm. the ageism is the other way round. That in aged care, you know, if you go through my aged care, you do not get enough funding, mm -hmm. even though we know that, as you um, you point out, after we turn 65, we are more likely to have um, an impairment that, fun that relates so, to so function. So it's actually capped budgets and capped number of services. So it's not even like if you're assessed as having a disability, you get you get some money but less. Thanks. You're actually, they just say, well, we're full. So you may have been assessed as having your only option, you know, is prevention aged care if you can't get home-based support. So the discrimination is quite anyway, another, another question. I think we need a, we need a seminar on it. Yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank all the speakers because it's been really useful. I am a disability and domestic violence worker with the Women's Health Centre. So I've been running a project for four years of four women who have, are really disadvantaged in this whole environment. And my clients would really be Frida's interviewees. And everything Frida put up reflects exactly, I've got about 32 clients and your breakdown would almost be match for match. Most of them are not eligible. Some of them have no idea. Some of them are completely incapable of being able to navigate their way through. I'm a two day a week worker and I've got NDIS funded brokers and service providers trying to dump their clients on me and want me to do their work for them to actually try and get them onto NDIS or get the plan changed or find someone else to manage the package. I mean, I've just got off the phone today to, from a woman, a mother who's just really frustrated. Um, I would like to see, you know, the picture of what could happen. Mm -hmm. They were warned about this. They were warned not to go down this you road. Two thousand. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember very well because I was in Canberra. I was part of those early negotiations mm -hmm. about the implementation, and I know that Bill was warned about choosing this option over this option. But most of disability DPOs were actually, you know, praising Bill. Oh yeah. I uh, look. To be fair, he had to try and make a choice about doing something because, and so what he was looking at was models and he was being told by the experts in the field which way to go on that. Well, because they weren't disabled people, they were disabled. Uh, they were, advocates. Uh, you know, the big charities and the big, you know, 
corporate yeah. charities, etc. Um, look, I'd urge people to get back to Bill. Who's, it is his portfolio area. He is prepared to listen. He now knows about a lot of the things that are wrong. Don't give up, you know. When bureaucrats design things, they never work because what you said is, is exactly right. This is a construct. It's a deliberate construct. It's a neoliberal construct to save money. So the state governments were overjoyed when they could work out how they could save money. When they put a 65 cutoff on, that also is about saving money. That shouldn't be what we are guided by. It should be guided by what we and dis people with disabilities actually want to get out of the system. Yeah. So that's going to mean having a fight about a whole lot of aspects of it, really. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's such a great, such a great and useful comment. Um, it is. It is ten past five. Um, we always we always run a little bit over time. <laughs> um, so I I would um, any more questions any more for Phil or Freda? Yeah, any more questions for Phil or Frida? Just, yep. Um, just picking up on Frida's findings about the lack of understanding of a lot of the participants you interviewed about the NDIS and also how they can make their way through the bureaucratic maze in applying for financial support. Um, do you have any comments about how that can be improved? Um, and what is being done to s support people in applying. I don't know if our Disability Trust uh, guests can uh, answer that. I think they're involved in some sort of support. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, how is the uptake of psychosocial supports, which has, I, I believe, recently been, um, has become part of the NDIS uh, program, how's that being taken up and how's that going? Unfortunately, I understand that there's a lot of support like Disability Trust, they're helping a lot, they're trying to help a lot. But look at our clients in Venice. Most of them just have no hope or no, can't get any help, no friends. A lot of, especially with mental illness as well, if you don't have a carer, if you don't have a family, you'll just be sitting at home all the time or be homeless. A number of them just be sit, uh, sleeping on the street. We have a lot of clients, especially female as well. So we'll be wandering on the street, at least they have stole, um, and now we've got a homeless hub. And I've heard from them that the police said that it's worse than ever. In the past, Piccadilly probably is the worst place to stay in. Now it's the homeless hub. So I don't, just can't see any improvement at the moment. Yeah, I was just going to add into that just before you as well. Like one of the interesting things, because our company Beyond Empathy has a focus on people who experience constant or recurring hardship or multiple layers of disadvantage, that's all that sort of jargon. But I suppose when we started that Blue Rose project, we also went to the various disability organisations to talk to them about it and say, do you think people would be interested? But one of our questions was, um, yeah, are there people out there who are not using verbal language as their main way to communicate, but who also may not have a lot of finances or might, like might, there might be other layers of disadvantage. But I have to say, it w that was like hitting a brick wall. It was like they didn't know. And so that's interesting to me because that I think that it's because a lot of those people are not tapped in. Um, if I think about the community that we work with in public housing, yeah, there's a few, but like there's one young boy who probably should be on the NDIS. He just wanders from his place and walks all the way to Warilla and back every day. That's all he does. Um, anyway, so yeah, I think there's a really big gap there. Is that right? Or do you want to? Yeah. Well, it's partly to do with the fact that it's an insurance system. So unless yeah. you can make a claim, you don't get it. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's not mm. insurance. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was kind of for Frida, but then you've tapped into that a bit as well. But um, I was, when you said you're, you're talking to people and they have no friends and they have no family, mm. did it come up at all, I guess, more like um, anything about um, those more incidental, uh, you know, interactions and relationships? There's been research, I guess, that's come out about probably what we consider more acquaintance networks and um, and whether that's something that those people have in their lives or your research tapped into or whether they're shut out of that too because they don't go to the shops because they're financially disadvantaged or, or whatever. It's a lot of, I think a, a number of clients that I visit, I've been doing this home visit for the past, this is my six years joining them. So I've been seeing a lot of them and talking to them. It takes time to develop this 
uh, relationship with them. At the beginning, they won't talk to you at all. It's some some sort of barrier. I th at the beginning, I thought that because I'm Asian, <laughs> or I don't speak very well in English. That's but then it turns out that it's not. They just have some. Just there's some something in between them. So it takes some time. If you keep visiting time and time again, then they will open up a bit more. But otherwise, it's really, really difficult. And then I sort of think that is maybe if you have some mental or social cycle problem, you, you won't even realize that you have that issue. They know that they don't have enough food. They're hungry. That's why they call. But other than that, so how, can we, how can they get help if they don't even know that they need help? My, my question goes, um, back to you, Frida. So since you've done your research mm -hmm. and you say that you volunteer with the Salvos. Oh, no, that was uh, Vinnie's. Oh, sorry, Vinnie's. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what um, policies, procedures or changes within Vinnie's have been incorporated? So if you know where the gaps are, what has Vinnie's specifically done to support your clients since then? Well, this is a bit of a complication because when we in do the interview, it's a sort of... Um, uh, conflicts of interest because part of Venice they s provide support f uh, for the NDIS as well. That's why when I'm trying to continue this project, but it's, we hit a lot of hurdles because they are part of the not NDIS providers, but they do set up centers. Uh, what is that called? I forgot. What um, it's sort of a ILC. Yes, uh, so th that's why they they have to get the approval from the NDIA as well to conduct similar or further uh, research. I know that they have been changing their policies as well. They have uh, got a big meeting, changing their strategic policies to make sure that it's covered, disability. But it's just, I find it really hard for them to work on it as well. They're asking me to work on a new project, how to improve their surface. This is one way that they, they like to do. But then we've been six months, keep negotiating what could be done, what can't be done, what questions we can ask, what questions that we can't ask. So it's a long process, even though they would like to improve the surface. But because of the NDIA, they get, need to get everything approved by them as well. I was just gonna say, because it's about that dismantling of the community services network as well mm. because the community services the neighborhood centers which have had their funding frozen and now it's all being diverted into only being about early intervention for under five-year-olds it's like it, in they're, they're the services even though they were never funded very well who like vinnies and so on are going to be able to tap into those and link those things i remember thinking like going back as far as when my sister linda got her place that was only because my mum who you know didn't ever go to university but was the ducks of the school, was a good writer. She made all her friends write gazillions of letters to, you know, everybody in order to get that thing. But I was working in a public housing estate in Western Sydney with a family. Both the parents were illiterate. I went, they're never going to get anything. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Um, I'd just like to come in on neighbourhood centres because I've just been at the international conference on neighbourhood centres, which is happening at Novotel. And... Um, uh, there's a speaker from England who's very good, but there seems to be, you know, an agreement that the only way forward, because funding is going to be cut and cut and cut under, uh, you know, far right governments like we have, is learning about social entrepreneurship. Now, this sort of shivers down my spine, but on the other hand, this is why people, you know, in Britain have decided there's, there's no other option. We have to start making money. Um, I mean, Britain's a very different case to, to Australia, but the pressure now to innovate and to be social entrepreneurs is, is, is definitely on. We can't avoid it. Um, and I think that's going to be really, really tough. But, you know, that's the way it's going. And neighbourhood centres, of course, um, are not getting... I mean, neighbourhood centre workers are not getting pay rises at all this year. I mean, the CPI is gone for them. Um, and they are being encouraged to sort of... But they have to learn to be business people, basically. Um, but if we're going to compete at all to, you know, cover all the people that you mentioned, to cover the over 65s, that's the only game in town. Um, 
And, um, you know, I've been arguing with the guy from England for about the last 12 hours because, um, you know, he basically is, is a social justice sort of guy. But he says, we can't do anything else in England but start buying pubs, buying clubs, if we can, buying empty buildings. And this is what, you know, the sort of progressive social welfare scene in England now looks like. And particularly if you could buy stuff off councils or, um, you know, uh, I mean, big corporates, but maybe they've got a building they don't want anymore because it's down in Port Kembla or wherever, whatever, and start doing that alternative way forward. It's frightening, but that's what, on the, that's what the name of the game is. Um, thank you. Such a fantastic panel. I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you to, for everyone who's coming and for contributing and for the discussion. Um, and I, I hope that we'll be able to see this on the Facebook page um, and also um, continue to comment it and, and, um, and post and repost um, so that we can um, push this conversation out even further because I think what's been discussed today is crucially important and also um, having, having Phil, Phil here to kind of push it forward too into spaces of of creativity and innovation and connection, I think really helps um, us to see see you know um, ways ways and futures that um, that are possible. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. Thanks.